All right, hello. This lecture is supposed to happen on the 16th, but it is the 10th, so we're just going to do it now. Uh, today's lecture is about files, and I guess let's just go on into it. This is, this is weird for me, too. Uh, so we have already, we've talked about two different ways of getting data from the user into your program. So we've used CN before, and we've also used command line arguments. The, the last piece that we haven't talked about yet is reading from a file, because there's, that's the third way of getting input. Someone saves a file, and then you want to read that and get all the information, do cool stuff with it. Uh, and then there's also, again, three ways to output something. We've done it to the terminal using cout and cair. And then also, we can make a file. We can write to it, one that already exists, or just make a brand new one. And so today, we're going to talk about reading and writing from files. Uh, so here is an iClicker question that I'm not going to ask you to do, so maybe pause the video and think about it, and then we'll talk about the answer. So assuming you've thought about it, uh, files will be stored on your hard drive, and that is in secondary memory. When we're going to read them into the program, uh, we're going to copy them into main memory so that we can actually use them, just like when you run a program. So here is like my whiteboard for the day, and I will be typing notes here. So uh, maybe I can make this bigger. Yeah. So files are stored in secondary memory. For example, on your hard drive, like on a flash drive. And when you uh, load them, or when you read them into your program, they get copied into main memory. And then, of course, if you're like, if there was a number inside, eventually you're going to put that number on the processor and add one to it, maybe. Uh, files are not stored in your programs. Your programs themselves are files. So the answer is definitely going to be B for this one. Where is my drawing thing. There we go. So, answer is B, and hopefully that makes sense. Before you actually read them, files are going to be stored inside of secondary memory. And, alright, so here's the strategy. We're going to talk about exactly how to read from files first, and there is, like, uh, a common set of things that you need to do. So the first thing is, well, you better open the file, you find it somewhere, know where it is on your uh, on your hard drive some path from the current working directory that you're in, maybe it's in the same directory, and it's very possible that like you're out of space on your hard drive, or like you gave a weird name that doesn't make any sense, or the file didn't exist to begin with, so problems could go, uh, problems could happen when you're trying to read this file, and in that case you better stop your program if you expected that the file was open, and then uh, Eventually, you're going to have a file, if everything went right, you're going to have a file to read from, and then uh, assuming that the data is arranged in some kind of format that you know about, you'll probably read uh, from the file in a loop, usually line by line, process it somehow, and then eventually you're going to get to the end of the file and you're going to stop. Uh, stop trying to read because there's nothing else to read. And then it's always good strategy to close the file once you're done with it, because maybe your program wants to continue working, maybe other programs want to use the file, and it gets locked if you uh, try to read from it. So it's always good uh, programming strategy to close the actual file that you're trying to read from. Uh, but if you're at the end of your program, uh, the file will get closed once your program finishes anyway. So let me put that here. Your all files, open files, will get closed when your program terminates. So technically you don't have to close the file at the very end. If that is all your program was doing, the program is about to end, you don't have to close it. But I'm going to show you me closing it just because we want to be good programmers, right? And so translating that into code is going to look like this. Uh, we're going to use this new library called fstream, and it's going to work a lot like iostream. So let me go to the uh, like the C++ reference page for this. 
Uh, so if you look at the fstream header, we're going to see that we have two things. The first one that we're going to look at is ifstream, which stands for input file stream. And we can do some stuff, one of which is use it exactly like CN. We have the same greater than, greater than operation that we can pull stuff out of it from. And then also we're going to use uh, a function that, oh gosh, I forget where it lives. It probably lives in, hmm. Algorithm? Let me just search for it. Uh, get line, C++. This function gets an entire line at a time. And it lives, ah, it lives in the, either the string library or the iStream library, apparently. So yeah, we'll have to include string. So we get this function that reads an entire line at a time for us. Which will be helpful. All right, so uh, there should really be a main function here. Just imagine that there is a main function. Uh, because here's like everything above, everything below is code that should be inside of a function somewhere. So the thing that we're going to do first is make this ifstream object, which is going to uh, keep track of whatever file we're in, right? And then we're going to open that file that we're trying to get at. Maybe it's called numbers.txt. And then we better check whether or not the open actually worked, because maybe the file didn't exist we, or something else weird happened. And in that case, we don't want to continue our program. We should probably exit. And then in a loop, maybe we can try getting lines one at a time. And the syntax there is use your IF stream that corresponds to the file that's open and get an individual line into some string uh, variable called line. So we have to have above this somewhere, like a string line. Ah, this is not helpful. We need to declare a string line somewhere. Let me start typing, maybe. Yeah. Declare a string line variable. Because IFS, or the skit line function, is going to write to that line variable, whatever the contents of the current line it's on. Uh, and then eventually, we want to check again whether or not we reach the end of the file. And uh, it's this not operation, like we're pretending that IFS is a Boolean value and it can check for a number of things, whether or not the open failed or whether or not we hit the end of the file. So maybe I should start writing about that. Uh, so not IFS. What does that actually mean? It's like saying interpret IFS as some kind of, like, as a Boolean variable. It's true if the file that is open, or it's true if the file is good still, for some definition of good. Uh, so it'll become false if uh, we couldn't open the file. That's a bad thing. Or if we tried to read past the end of the file. That's another bad thing that could go wrong, and that will make IFS go from true to false. And I'm going to give an example of this just in a second. Let me finish explaining this. And so eventually you're going to hit past the end of the file. You should stop reading if you're still trying to read. And then we want to close uh, the file that you're trying to read because you're done with it now. There should be a semicolon here, of course. Uh, so with that, I think we should go to some examples. So here is code for, I think, ah, sorry, I want to write to files first. So here is the alternative. Uh, here's reading a file. You can also write to it using uh, changing the i to an o, an of stream. So we'll create an of stream object. That should be an o. Oh, and it made it a circle, but you understand. All right, and then we'll open it again, just uh, for writing purposes now. And we will write whatever we want to write. Apparently, we're going to write some animal names, and that is going to give us examples for the lab that you'll be doing with files. You'll be counting the number of ducks that are in a file, because why not? 
So here is this uh, all coded up. Uh, so we've got to include fstream because now we can get at ifstream and ofstream. That will give us uh, the ability to write to files. And we want to write to a file first. We'll call it animals.txt. It will be ofstream. And this is just the name of a variable. OFS, you can change this to like my file or whatever you want to call it. It makes no difference at all. Uh, it's just a variable and I'll tend to use OFS and IFS. All right, so here we've made the file, we've declared it, but we need to actually open whatever we're trying to write to. And so we're gonna say, all right, open animals.txt. And we should really check, like, did something go wrong? Like maybe we couldn't open the file. In that case, uh, we should exit. And if we're gonna exit, uh, we better include lib. All right, and let's see. Assuming nothing went wrong, we'd get here, and we could start writing to the file. And by default, OFS's, OF streams are going to overwrite whatever's there. So if you wanted to continue adding stuff to it, you want to do what's called appending to a file, and that's what I'll talk about next. But right now we're going to overwrite whatever was there. Maybe the file doesn't even exist yet. Uh, right now, if I go to my 7.16 folder, I do not have a file in this current working directory called animals.txt. So, when I run this program, it's going to make it, because wherever you run the program, it will make a new file in that current working directory called animals.txt. Right? And so now, let's maybe compile it. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to close the file, because we're done with it. But technically, you don't have to because the program's, program's about to end. Technically. The program is about to end, and the file will get closed automatically. But we are good programmers. So we're going to do it anyway. All right. And so the idea is we open this file. Either it does or doesn't exist. We're going to overwrite it either way. And we're going to write one two, three, four lines to it, okay? With those things. So let's watch it happen, and maybe we should make a make file for it. So let's make a new file called make file, and let's make a rule for this files1 program. So it's going to be called files1, and in order to make it, we require the source code, files1.cpp. And we're going to go and use G++, the name of the file, dash O, the name of the thing we're trying to get. And now I can just say make files underscore one. Technically, I could have just set it and used the default rule, but we are being fancy today. All right, so make files underscore one. All right, now we have a program to run. Let's run it. Files1. And hey, it made a new file in my current working directory called animals.txt. So if I look at it, it has exactly what I typed, duck, cow, goat, parrot, and then a new line. So it's like waiting on the fifth line there. And that's exactly what we wanted. Uh, so yeah, that is an example of using OF streams to write to a brand new file or overwriting what's there. So like, let me change this a little bit. Like, let me put another duck or something, and I'm going to rerun the program. And what it does is it overwrites the file again with whatever it writes. And so you can't use OFStream uh, in non-append mode if you want to add stuff to the file that you're trying to write to. All right, so let's move on, because maybe we want to add stuff, and we want to keep what was there. So uh, if you've never heard this word before, it is append. Appending adds to the end of a file and keeps what was there. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to open this file in append mode this time. And let's be fancy and actually like check that it worked. So the idea here now is, yes, we're going to make an off stream, but we're going to give a second argument to the open function. 
on OFS. You can say, yeah, open this file, but open it in a very special way. That's what this iOS colon colon app stands for. Open this in append mode, okay? And then, at that point, OFS is going to be sitting. Uh, you can pretend like OFS is Microsoft Word or something. And when you open it in normal mode, it's going to like delete everything and put its cursor right at the beginning of the file. Yeah? But when you open it in append mode, it's going to go and scroll to the very end of the file, put its cursor at the last possible moment, and then start typing there once you add things. So when you say output this, what it's going to do is it's going to find, all right, here's the file, go to the very end, start typing what you asked me to type, and that should be what the file becomes. I hope that makes sense. So at that point, uh, we can close the file because we're going to add one line to it at the very end, and that's going to be that. So every time I run this program, it's going to open this animals.txt file and add horse to the end. Okay? So let's watch that happen in real time. Ah, let's make another rule, because why not? Let's actually get even fancier. Files 1.5. Maybe we can say that it needs files 1.5.0, the object file. And then we'll use that to make the actual executable file. Let me make sure I spelled all these right. Yeah, okay. But then, hey, how do we make files 1.5.0? Well, we could use a default rule, but we could also do it ourselves. That requires the source code file as a requirement, as like an ingredient, files 1.5.cpp. And then to make it, we do g++-c, name of the file. So this will make for us uh, this will make files 1.5.0 for use by the above rule. And so now we're going to have a chain of rules. It's going to be like, ah, files 1.5. To make that, I require files 1.5.0. Ah, I don't have that yet. Maybe there's a rule for me to make it with. And yes, yes, there is. I'm going to go and do this rule first. It's like a stack of things now. Uh, that requires a file, a source code file that does exist in the same working directory. And I'm going to use that to make the .o file. And then I have it. I can come back to this rule and make the thing I was trying to make, which was a final executable program. All right. So here I am. I can say make files uh, 1.5 now. And so we ran both rules now to make the .o file first and then the executable file second. And so now let me go to the animals.txt file and start running this. So animals.txt. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to run a, a text file. That slash file is 1.5, excuse me. And so there's no output because we didn't output to the terminal, but we output it to the file. So if I reload the file, hey, now it's got a horse at the end of it. And I can run this again, and it adds another. I can run it three times, and it adds a bunch. But the second I run files one, it will overwrite everything because we don't open the file in append mode there, only here. I hope the difference is clear. So that's writing to files. And let's see. I'm going to save that for the very end. Let's talk about reading from files. So the idea here now is IFS change, or OFS changes to IFS, IF streams, because we want to get input. I stands for input. And now let's read this file that we made. So it exists, we can open it, and let's get a line at a time and just like output it to ourselves. So there's this program called, uh, there's this terminal program called cat, and I love cats, so it's wonderful. Cat, what it does is it, uh, cat is short for concatenate. The terminal program cat concatenates files. So if you say cat animals.txt, it'll print out the contents of that file to the terminal. So the idea here is we're trying to make our own cat program. So cat animals.txt. It just prints everything out. And so the idea of this files underscore two program is we're going to emulate that uh, functionality by opening the file and 
getting a line at a time and printing that line. Okay? So we're going to open it, just like we do for OFS. And because it's an IF stream, it will open, it will open in read mode. And what it's going to do is it's going to put its cursor, because it's, again, you can pretend it's like Microsoft Word, it's going to put it at the start of the file. It's waiting to read this time, though. All right? So now, now, uh, well, assuming the file opens, now the cursor is waiting at the start of the file to read stuff. Okay? And so now we're going to get a line at a time, put it in the string called line, and do stuff with that. So we're going to use this function called get line, which lives in the string header. And so we're going to use IFS, read from that, and then put it into the line variable. So the idea is something like this, uh, get line IFS, uh, like line is the name of the variable, and the direction the data is flowing is like from here to here, take one line and put it in there. Yeah, let me put this up here. Read one line and put it in the variable called line from IFS. Okay, so that is the idea of that function, and we're going to see it in action. And then eventually, eventually we're going to get to, we're going to try and read past the end of the file. Okay? And the position of this not IFS is very, very important. Uh, if we put it in a different spot, uh, things will go wrong, and I will show you uh, that in just a second. So let me run through what's going to happen. So in this uh, in this loop, here's what we're going to do. It's going to open the file. It's going to start here with its cursor, right before the D, and it's going to get a line. All right, it's going to put it in the line variable. So after the first iteration of the loop, the contents of the line variable will be duck. All right? And then the cursor, having read one line, will be sitting now on the second line. Okay? So again, like after you read it, uh, get line moves its cursor thing. to the next line after it reads one. Okay? And so in the next iteration of the loop, we're going to read cal. And then in the next iteration, we're going to have, or right before it at least, our cursor is going to be sitting at the beginning of the third line. And then when we call get line, it'll get all, of, all the contents of that third line, excluding the new line character, that is. And so eventually, we're going to do this nine times. And eventually, we're going to be sitting right here on a line that is empty. All right? And at that point, we will call get line, and get line will read past the end of the file. So like we're, we've got duck, gal goat, all the way down to horse, horse. This is still way too thick. And that's the end of the file. So eventually, like our cursor is going to be sitting right here, and there's no more file left. Right? There is. Yeah, it's probably better. Easier for you to read if I type it. There is no more file left. So when you call get line, when the cursor is here, it'll try to read past the end of the file. Okay? And so eventually, like the cursor is not going to be here, there's going to be like some end of file marker, you can think of it like that, and the cursor is going to swap from being right there to being right there. You see that? And once it's here, once it's here, IFS is here, it becomes false, right? Because it read past the end of the file. And that is our stopping condition. And notice that it took a call to get line to get this, which means that this check needs to happen right here, because otherwise, 
we have to check right here because once you read past the end of the file, you wouldn't have got any new information and put it in the line variable. Any new info to put in the line variable. Let me put this on separate lines. How far can we read? That far. Let's do like this. Okay. So that's the idea of that. And then, assuming we got a line, it was still a good line to get, we'll output it. And finally, we'll close the file. So, we have made our cat program. Let us watch it work. Uh, let's make another rule for it. Let's be fancy again. Let's make the dotto and the executable file. This is files two. Boop, 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 boop. Files two. All right. So first, it's going to make files two dot o out of files two .cpp by running this rule first. Then this rule to make files2 out of files2.0. OK. And let's watch it run. Make files2. Oops. Somehow tried to use files1.5 for some reason. Ah. I forgot to change that one. Hello. OK. Now it'll compile. Yay. All right, so we'll run files2. And the idea is it's going to go through a line at a time, get everything, output every line again. OK? And so it's outputting the exact same file to us. We made our cat program. It's the same as saying cat animals.txt. Awesome. All right, I think, uh, no. All right, I'll save this for after this eye clicker question that isn't a real eye clicker question because you're not physically here right now. All right, so take a minute to think about this very subtle question, and then we'll talk about the answer. So assuming you thought about it, let us uh, just type all these out. Here's option A, here's option B, let me just make two files with that. Uh, let me get some boilerplate from here. It's like option underscore A dot CPP. Let's get everything out of here. All right. Uh, well, let's make it be animals.txt again. All right, so uh, remember that while one is like while one is a true value, right? The true number. Oh gosh, why is this so difficult? This is hard to select everything. I'm just going to copy everything. Nope, not like that. Come on. I'm trying so hard, I promise. All right, I'm just going to type it myself. So while one get line, ifs line, and we need a string line variable, then uh, if not ifs, break, see out line, new line, versus uh, the other option, option b, which is just checking not while true anymore, while IFS is true. So eventually this will be false once we repass the end of the file, right? Uh, just do a get line and then output that line always. Okay, let's watch this work. Option A, option B. Uh, we love our make files today, so let's just, just go hard with our make files. Two, three, four, option A, option B. All right, so let's compile and run these. Make option A, option A. And hey, I think it does the same thing. It found everything that we needed, and it printed them all out. That was, there were, there were five horses, right? Cat, animals, .txt. Yeah, there were. Awesome. So that did it right. So A is totally a valid answer. Well, let's see what B does. Oops. I need to make it. Option B. Ooh. Ooh, what happened here? There is an extra line. There is an extra line. And actually, 
let me change this file just a little bit to have no new line at the end. Now let's run option A and option B. And this makes this, the problem even more apparent. It outputted five horses, option A, that's correct, there are only five. Option B outputted six. Uh oh. So the answer is totally A. But why? Why is it so important to check for IFS in the way that it's being checked right here in A? What's the real difference? So the idea is after you call getLine, it's going to move that cursor, right? So like we're sitting right here. Call get line. We're going to get the horse. Yeah? And then we're sitting right here, about to read past the end of the file. Like you can pretend there's that EOF thing right here, and there's nothing else. It'll take a call to get line to do that. All right? So get line reads past the end of the file on the last iteration of the loop. In this case, right here, it'll notice immediately that it read past the end of the file. The line variable doesn't get updated when it does that, and so it stops. Stops the program because there's, we didn't read anything useful. We read past the end of the file, okay? And so it does not output that last line variable. While B will, what it does it'll, is it, again, it'll be sitting here ready to read the end of the file marker. Get line will read that, and so now it will set IFS to false. And so IFS is false right now, but we haven't checked. We're about to output line. Oh man. But what was line? It was whatever the previous line was, because it doesn't get changed once we repass the end of the file. That was no fun. That was incorrect. And so it's very important to check right after, immediately after, right here, whether or not you read past the end of the file. You see that? So that is that is the key. Because you get line, we'll possibly read past the end of the file and put no useful information into line. You better check before you use the line that you tried to just read. Okay? So let me put that into words on the notes page. Uh, whenever you better check whether or not you read past the end of the file whenever, immediately after, end of the file, immediately after reading something. Because otherwise, it's possible that you didn't get any new information. In the case of get line, that line variable will be whatever the previous line was. Okay? So that is that. And I think that will make sense then. Uh, so yeah, always check. Always check in that particular order. And that should be that. Alright, so let me see what else I have here today. So I have this files 3 and it's a bit more complicated example. Uh, it has this file called uh, Parrot Sketch, which is from Monty Python. Uh, this is another professor's example, and I love it, so I'm stealing it. So here is the text of this Parrot Sketch thing. You can find it on YouTube. It's, it's pretty funny. I like my British humor. So uh, it's called the Parrot Sketch because they say parrot a lot. It's like, like this dead parrot that one person th thinks is alive and the other doesn't. So uh, there are a lot of occurrences of the word parrot in this file. Yeah? Let us count all of them. That is the objective of this files 3.cpp file. So we're going to open the file, make sure it actually opened, and again, you can return one because returning from main is the same as calling exit1. Returning from main stops the program. From main only, though. Exit will stop the program from wherever you are. And so we're going to count how many times we see parrot. And so initially we have no parrots that we've seen. And we're going to ask the user how many times we want them, how many, uh, how many lines you want us to consider. So 
we'll ask the user to uh, whether they want us to count the parrots in the next line by having them enter a new line to continue or something else to stop and I'll show you what that means when we give an example so we're going to keep on getting a character from the user using uh, CN a special function from CN and as long as the user keeps typing new line we're going to try and count the number of parrots in the next line of the file so we're going to read the file line by line of course and stop once we hit the end uh, we'll output the uh, whatever line we have and then we're going to see if that line contains parrot and this is a string function so let's go to the string library we're already mostly there so every string has a dot find operation and it searches for where that thing was so starting from the beginning usually so this is a default argument so look in your string for this character for this uh, for the string parrot and return back to me the starting position of the string where parrot occurs and so It'll return negative one if uh, it doesn't exist in the string, but it will return a non-negative number if it does, because that will be the index into the string where it starts. Okay, so we'll output that thing. It'll be negative one or a positive number. And if we found it, if there is at least one parrot in that line that we're reading, we'll add one to this numParrots variable. And then we'll keep asking the user, hey, do you want me to figure out or count the number of parents on the next line? And this is a function that you have not seen before, I don't think, and it's called cn.git. And so it's part of iostream, it's part of cn. Uh, where is that? It's input output iostream. iostream, we have cn. cn is an iStream iStreams have a git function, which gets a single character, and I hate how they convert it to an integer, but git is a function that you can think of returns a single character that represents the uh, whatever the user entered, and it gets a single character at a time, which is good for us because we want to keep on getting whether or not it's a new line or just something else, like a Q for quit or something. And you can think of cn.git as essentially like make a... Uh, like cn a single character at a time, but I'm pretty sure it skips white space. And so that's why cn git is being used here because we want to actually get a new line character, which is a white space character. So you, I don't think you can use this, but try and prove me wrong maybe. And so as long as the user is letting us continue, we will keep on executing this loop. And at the very end, we will stop when the user tells us to stop or when the file ends and at that point we'll output the number of lines that had parrot at least once in it okay and we'll close the file because we're good programmers so let us go back make our make file let's use the default dot o for this one just to spice up our lives files underscore three we'll make the dot o file using the default dot o file making rules which will work for us just fine so we'll say make files underscore three. And then here's the default role getting run to make the .o file. And then we're going to run using that .o file to make our final executable program using that line. And so we'll do files three. And all right, let me open this uh, parrot sketch thing. And so it doesn't look like there's a parrot until uh, line eight. So got to keep on pressing enter eight times or seven times, that is. And so here we go. Yeah, the first one, the first line, there's nothing there. Negative one. Second line, again, no parrots, negative one. Keep on going. Ah, there it is. All right, we got there. And so it looks like on index 68 into the string, that is right here. If you put your cursor there, that's where the parrot starts. And so that's a non-negative number. 
And so it'll count that one. And we can keep on going. Oh, there's a parrot there. Eee, there's a parrot. Oh, a parrot there and there. And so now if I press Q, like we keep on pressing, I uh, keep on pressing new line, just enter. Now we're waiting for C and get right here. If I press Q and enter, C and get will get the Q character and not the new line character. And that will stop the program. It will stop the loop, which will eventually stop the program. It's like, ah, oh, you read four lines with parrot in it. Haha. -ha. And yeah, let's just keep on pressing enter, have it do the whole thing. Yay. So apparently there are eight lines with parrot in it in this file. There are some long lines, though. Uh, there are, parrot exists multiple times in some lines, though. And the way to read uh, multiple times is, like, have it start somewhere else. So, like, if parrot existed here, uh, I don't know, parrot. If, you're, if this was your string, it was, like, parrot, space, parrot. If this was a string called s, string s equals that. If that was your string, and you said s dot find parrot, it will always give you uh, zero. So that is the starting index of the first parrot. But if you wanted to have it find the second one and see if there was a second one, you could say s dot find parrot at some index after this first one starts. So you can give one, you could also give zero, one, two, three, four, five, like six, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So you can give six or one, whatever you think makes sense to you. This should give us six, seven, because that is the new starting index, because zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's the new starting index of uh, the second parrot. So start looking. That's what the second optional argument says. Start looking yeah. at index six in the string. Okay, so that's how that works. And yeah, that is a more complicated example of reading from files. And I want to do one last one. And I'm really bummed that I'm not here because it usually involves audience participation, so I'm just going to have to assume some stuff. Uh, but I want to make a translation program. So here is our strategy. So translation program. I picked a song, and we're going to translate some lyrics of the song. We're going to output translated uh, text. So here's the idea. Let me make it like a list or something. Yeah, cool. So read a word at a time from a lyrics.txt file. So we're going to translate the song, try to pick a song that you all know, and it shall be let it go from Frozen. And if uh, translate that word, if we know how to translate it. And then we'll output the translated word instead in that case. Otherwise, we'll just keep the other word around. OK. And this will be the last example from this, for this lecture. So the idea is, all right, let's make a new file, blank from scratch, translate.cpp. Include iostream, because we're going to output stuff. To the user, we're going to output the translated text, include fstream, because we're going to output, uh, we're going to read from a file, we need the if stream using namespace std. We're going to work with strings, so I'll use the string library, and I think that's good enough for now. Uh, let's make a main function. We don't need any command line arguments, but why not keep them around? Sure. Uh, so the idea now is we're going to open lyrics.txt. So we're going to make an if stream. ifs, that's our favorite word for it. We could always call ifs something else though. It's like lyrics, or whatever you want to call it. Let's actually call it lyrics, because why not? And we're going to open that file, 
lyrics.txt. And we better immediately check like if it's not good. Because maybe the file opening failed. Like I could say like the wrong name and it would fail. If not lyrics, uh, return one C error maybe. Issue error opening file. New line. Okay. Continuing. Uh, so now the file is open. But let's read a, a word at a time, a string word. And this is where, uh, this is a quirk of, I guess, CN, in that when you say CN word uh, for any string variable, when you CN into a string variable, you get a single word. So that's that is something white space separated. And we'll see if that's good enough for us in a in a second. But we're gonna be using that in a loop though. So alright, let's do while true. Read a word. Possibly translate the word. I'll put the word. And so this is where the audience participation happens. So we're going to get a word, cn score word. Uh, and eventually the file is going to stop. I need to think about where I need to check for that. Here might work. Uh, yeah, here, it, I mean, it's necessary. If not, and it's not ifs anymore, it's lyrics. That's the name of our if string variable. If not lyrics, break. And we're going to say string new word, maybe. We'll have a translate function. Translate the word we had. And then we'll output it. See out uh, word. And maybe some spaces in between all the words. So we're going to change this to preserve whatever was there. But for now, this is going to work. So all right, we need a translate function, string. Take a string, return a string. And yeah, let's find some stuff to translate. So this is the idea. Uh, we're going to read a word at a time and possibly translate one of those words. Uh, I think it's usually easier for nouns. So let's just pick a few nouns and translate them all. Uh, so I would be asking you guys right now, hey, what languages do you know? Uh, let's pick a word and translate that into the language that you know. Uh, but I'm just going to have to make stuff up and assume things. So I know some Spanish. I assume there's some other people that know some Spanish. So the snow glows white on the mountain tonight. We're going to change snow to nieve. All right. So if word is equal to snow, we will return instead nieve. All right. Otherwise, let's pick another word in another language. Uh, nouns are usually easier. Uh, mountain. I assume that there are some people who speak Chinese in this class. So let us translate mountain to Chinese. Let us get the character. Uh, excuse my computer being in. Spanish. So yeah. I guess it's also Japanese too. So kill two birds with one stone. If it's equal to mountain, we will swap that out and return the Chinese character for mountain. Else if, I don't know, word is equal to, let's find another good noun, maybe like kingdom or something. Let's do what we got. Hmm. German. All right, you're going to enjoy me trying to pronounce these things. That is 
going to be fun for me. All right, return oh, if it is kingdom. Return Königreich or something like that. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Otherwise, we're going to return whatever the word was because we didn't know how to translate it. Okay. And so here's our strategy. Read a word at a time, possibly translate it. I'll put it back to the user. And that should be that. So let us make that program. Translate. All right. And let's see if I did anything wrong, because this was completely from scratch this time. Make translate. Try and put this over here. Yeah. Dot slash translate. It is, ah, yeah, excuse me. So I tried to read a word from the user. No, we need to read a word from the lyrics file. Excuse me. Let's recompile. Hey, okay, okay, let's see if we did it. No, the snow glows white on the mountain tonight. No, that's wrong. Why are we not translating our words? Let's see what we're actually getting. I think we're stopping at the right time, which is good. Uh, but let's see what's what's happening. Let's print out all the words that we see, uh, and not print out this. See out word, and maybe I'll put it in like quotes so that I can see exactly where it starts and where it ends. Because I made a mistake somewhere, and I'm not sure where. Okay. Where is like snow? Yeah, first we got the, then we got snow. Yeah, it was lowercase. What's going on? I don't want to have to stop this video, but we're going to figure this out together. Where does snow return that other thing? Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're yelling at me through your screen right now because you saw the issue before I did. Hey, you know that new word that we weren't using? There it is. Okay. Rerun. Yeah, the Nieve glows white on the Shan tonight. Not a footprint to be seen, a Königreich of isolation. Yes. Life is good. Okay, the very last thing that I want to do is preserve the white space. Because right now, right now, we're outputting just the word and then a space. That's, that's ugly. It was not like the lyrics. These lyrics are beautiful and they are arranged in a special way. There's a new line after tonight. There's an extra line after this stanza. We want to keep all that stuff around. And so the idea is we can read a character at a time of white space because when we try to read into a string variable, it's going to skip all that white space. But we want to keep it around. All right? So I'll put the new word. And then we will preserve the white space after that word. So we're going to see whether or not uh, we can do this. So if lyrics dot get. We'll get a single character at a time. But the problem with that is, like, if we're right here, yes, we'll get a new line character. If we're right here, yes, we'll get a space character. But if we were right here, we get the queue. And that, that would move the cursor of our IF stream, which is not what we wanted. So I'm going to use something called peak is equal to uh, slash n or there's actually a function called is space, and I'm going to use that. And that lives in a library called CC type. Oops, CC type. And this will return true if the character that you gave it was an actual space character. So peak gets a character without moving the cursor. 
And that's exactly what we want here, because maybe it wasn't a, sp a space character, in which case we didn't want to eat it up. So if it was a space character, we'll get it. So char c, whatever that was, space character equals lyrics dot git. Git actually moves the cursor. Now it makes sense to actually do that. And the idea is we want to output that now. And we want to do this as long as there's white space. Because maybe there's like, hey, two spaces. A new line and then a new line. Those are two space characters, yeah? So then we'll see out that space character, OK? And it's probably good strategy to actually like check for the fact that we can still read from the file. It might be okay, d depending on the way that peak is implemented, but I'm not quite sure. So we're going to be uh, better safe than sorry. All right. So I think that this should preserve the white space because it's going to like take what was there, a space or a new line. We were just outputting spaces before. And these are all everything after these words that we just read. Keep on getting those spaces and outputting them back out as they were. So we should, in theory, see these new lines appear now in the right spots. So uh, let's cross our fingers and rerun the program. Oops. Hey, OK, 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 good. And now we have preserved the spacing of the file by peeking and getting and testing for things in the right way. And yeah, I think that is enough of the example. I'm sorry for my bad pronunciations of all of the languages that I don't know, but I hope you enjoyed it. I think uh, that brings us to the end of these slides. Uh, and I have one more video lecture to record. But I think this is the end of this one. So thank you for putting up with me, and I'll see you in the next one. All right.